Hi, my name is Sean Polachek. I'm a professor in chemical and biological engineering at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm also deputy director for the NSF-funded Center for Cell Manufacturing Technologies. Our mission with CMAT is to uh, help the in help develop industry for making cell therapy products. Um, today, I'm going to tell you some work in my lab and in CMAT that focus on manufacturing cardiovascular cells from human pluripotent stem cells. So I think we all know what a human pluripotent stem cell is. They have two unique properties that make them very powerful from a biomanufacturing perspective. First, their pluripotency means they can generate any cell type found in the adult. And second, they have the potential for infinite self renewal. So based on these two properties, we can make any cell type we want and as much of that cell type as we want. So pluripotent stem cells have been used to make cells uh, in, in in vitro modeling to study development and disease, as well as by pharmaceutical companies to screen the effects of, of drugs and chemical compounds for safety and efficacy. There's also tremendous interest and activity in generating therapeutic cells from pluripotent stem cells. Now there are two main types of pluripotent stem cells. There's the embryonic stem cell, that is made by harvesting the inner cell mass of a blastocyst and the induced pluripotent stem cell that is made by reprogramming an adult cell type, typically a fibroblast or blood cell, back to pluripotent state through, through genetic factors. Today, I'm gonna treat both of these as roughly similar. Uh, there may be some epigenetic differences that, that contribute to uh, differentiation, but for the most part, both of these cell types have these two unique uh, properties of pluripotent stem cells. So in theory, again, we can expand pluripotent stem cells in an unlimited manner and differentiate that to any cell type we want. In practice, these are challenging. One, uh, spontaneous differentiation can occur, as well as these cells are genetically unstable. So we can't achieve this, in practice, unlimited expansion. Also, many differentiation processes suffer from low yield and, and reproducibility. I'm gonna focus more on, on this roadblock today. So it, our efforts to, in differentiation involve building upon what we know in developmental biology and trying to use that to come up with simple, safe and reproducible processes to manufacture somatic or specialized cell types of interest. So my lab is really focused on the process of turning a pluripotent stem cell into a cell type of interest. And we, we work with collaborators to make a lot of different cell types. Everything listed on this slide here are, are cell types we have worked on in the recent past or are currently working on. Uh, the majority of the lab's focus is in cardiovascular and neurovascular differentiation. Today I'm going to focus on cardiovascular but we do have projects in many other cell types of, of interest as well. Okay, so one of the most interesting cell types in the cardiovascular realm is, is the cardiac myocyte. So this is the contractile cell in the heart. Um, heart failure, I think we all know, is, is a major clinical problem, and this results in the case of a myocardial infarction by a, a blockage in the coronary artery that leads to a massive cell death in the muscle, muscle tissue in, in the left ventricle. Because there's low regenerative capacity of, of cardiac myocytes, uh, patients who've had a myocardial infarction suffer from permanent loss of cardiac function. Uh, one idea is to try to replace the contractile cardiomyocytes that are lost by cardiomyocytes that are differentiated from pluripotent stem cells. In fact, this concept is uh, currently being tested in a number of, of early stage phase one clinical trials around the world. Saki University has developed allogeneic sheets of these cardiomyocytes that are then grafted on the heart surface. A, a clinical trial in China by Health Therapeutics injects pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes into the myocardium. Stanford University, funded by California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, also uses injection in this case of embryonic stem cell drug cardiomyocytes to treat a more chronic left ventricular dysfunction. And uh, a startup company, a small company in, in Europe, HeartSeed, in collaboration with Novo Nordisk, 
is using suspensions of spheroids of cardiomyocytes injected into the myocardium to treat heart failure. All of these are, are dose response um, trials with a limited number of participants looking at safety at this particular point. Um, targeted completion is in the, the next couple of years, so we should have some interesting results, preliminary results for these types of studies soon. IPS cell drive cardiomyocytes are also used in a drug development pipeline at, at various stages from early discovery to provide human models to identify targets uh, in conjunction with animal models and preclinical studies uh, to try to identify subsets of responders in, in clinical trials and in personalized medicine applications after uh, approval. These IPS cardiomyocytes have uh, particular benefits in modeling human genetic diseases. Uh, cells can be reprogrammed from patients with these diseases or genetic mutations that affect heart function in a variety of different structures can be made to look at how drugs might impact treatment of that disease in an in vitro model. Now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the, the process of how we think about making or biomanufacturing cell types, including cardiomyocytes from, from a stem cell source. One of the early stages of, of manufacturing, and perhaps the, the simplest to implement, is a spontaneous differentiation process. So here we would take our, our stem cells, usually cultured in suspension, and remove the factors that would allow them to remain in, in the undifferentiated state, and perhaps add something like serum to stimulate differentiation. But what you'll get here is spontaneous differentiation to a lot of different lineages. So this is scalable. You can make a lot of cells, but it's relatively inefficient. You need a way to purify your cell type of interest. As the field evolves, we build on what we know about development of that tissue in, in vivo and try to come up with biomimetic processes. So these are processes that we try to replicate to the best of our ability uh, what happens during development by providing cues to the cells. This increases the efficiency of differentiation quite a bit, but also makes it more complex, right? So uh, this can lead to expensive and, and difficult to scale processes. I think that the next iteration of the process is to simplify these biomimetic approaches through what, what I term bio-inspired. So come up with processes that still capture some of the main features of development, but remove uh, some of the, the secondary features, right? So we try to find the orchestrators of, of differentiation to, to simplify these biomimetic approaches and make them more scalable, more robust, less expensive, but still maintain the efficiency and the defined nature. So in the evolution of cardiomyocyte differentiation processes, uh, and the field started with, with spontaneous differentiation in the bodies. This is work by Lear Gepstein at Technion around the year 2000. Um, what the Gepstein group did was they took the undifferentiated embryonic stem cells, formed embryoid bodies in suspension, and looked for contracting foci. So cardiomyocytes will, stem cells will undergo spontaneous contraction, and you can identify them just based on physical beating. So what they found is that after they plated these embryoid bodies, about five to 10 days after plating, they began to see emergence of these contracting foci, suggesting cardiomyocytes, and they stabilized after about 20 days. So uh, 20 days, they found about 8% of the embryoid bodies had contracting regions, but only small regions were contracting. So if you were to count the total number of cells in these cultures that are cardiomyocytes, it'd be less than 1% of the cells. Nevertheless, they were able to identify cardiomyocytes that could be studied. I work with my collaborator, Tim Camp's group, a few years later, was the first to generate cardiomyocytes from induced pluripotent stem cells. And again, uh, they used the spontaneous embryoid body differentiation method, found that the, comparing embryonic stem cell lines with two iPS cell lines, there was differences in efficiency of differentiation, but they were able to obtain contracting cardiomyocytes. And these were mixtures. So there were bioelectric physiology, there were mixtures of nodal pacemaker cells as well as atrial and ventricular cardiomyocytes. The majority are, are ventricular. Uh, then a few years later, 
a graduate student in, in my group, Lance Leon, developed a way to generate cardiomyocytes through modulation of lens signals. Right. So what, what Lance found is that by activating and inhibiting lens signaling with two small molecules at critical stages of differentiation, he was able to generate highly efficient uh, yields of, of cardiomyocytes. So here, the um, pluripotent stem cells are expanded and then differentiation initiated by act addition of the CHIR 99021 um, small molecule, which directs the cells toward a mesoderm lineage. Two days later, adding an IWP inhibitor will direct these to a cardiac mesoderm lineage, and then after culture in appropriate conditions, contraction begins around day seven. So we identified the yield or purity of these by flow cytometry at, at day 30, and found that about 70 to 80% of the cells expressed uh, E cardiomyocyte proteins, cardiac component P, and staying positive with the MF20 antibody. And the, the, this was robust across several different, different cell lines. Right? So uh, here, jump forward to our, our bio-inspired approach, where now we can, the field can generate cardiomyocytes in a fully defined manner that's driven by small molecules that control only one pathway. To be clear, um, WIMP signaling is not the only pathway involved in, in cardiomyocyte development or differentiation, but by modulating this pathway in a dish or bioreactor, we are able to direct pluripotent stem cells to this lineage. It's important to also consider uh, things other than markers, things like structure and function in assessing your, your cell type. So if we here do immunostaining we, for alpha actin and cardiac component I, we can see nice sarcomere formation and myofilament alignment. Um, the visual observation of these cells, we can see spontaneous contraction. The, the cardiomyocytes have a very low expansion, uh, so we can maintain them in culture for long periods of time without passaging. This sheet here is at about eight months. And uh, we, we collaborate with, with Team Camps Group to perform electrophysiology on these cells to look at action potentials across the cell membrane uh, by, by single cell microelectrode analysis. And based on the, the shapes of these curve, this curve, we can classify cells into subtypes. Again, here, here's an example of a ventricular cell. Uh, again, we, we do generate mixtures by this method. Um, all of these measures show that the cells we generate through this process are, are immature and, and fetal-like. So one roadblock in the field that I'll talk a little bit about more later in the presentation is how we can generate more adult-like cells for both in vitro modeling and potential cell-based therapies. Another type of analysis that we do is mechanical, so clearly a, a important phenotype of these cells is the ability to, to generate force. So we, we adapted a traction force microscopy method developed by Yu Wang in the late 1990s to the cardiomyocytes. Here we culture the cells on a flexible substrate embedded with fluorescent beads and then um, functionalize this with matrix gel, seed our cells on top of this and monitor the movement of these beads. Based on the mechanical properties of the gel, we can calculate the stress of the cells form on the gel. So here we have a single cardiomyocyte placed on a gel. You can see the fluorescent beads, and we can track the position of these beads, beads through time. This is on a, a gel with a, an elastic modulus of, of 15 kilopascals. So here, for that cell I showed in the last slide, based on the, the motion of the beads, we can calculate a stress map that is consistent with that motion. So you can see this the cell was was contracting in, in a, a polar manner. The highest stresses at, at the cell edges. And you can see that this is the based on the maximum and minimum contractility. Um, we performed experiments on substrates of different stiffnesses and calculated the average stress over the entire cell as a function of stiffness and found that if you place these cells on stiffer gels, they're going to generate more force, uh, similar to what we see with, with primary rat and neonatal cardiomyocytes. Right. So a couple of things here is that the, the cells do have this ability to sense and 
respond to stiffness by generate, generating additional force. And if you look at at least order of magnitude of, of stress generated, the, the IPS guide cardiomyocytes are fairly similar to those of, of primary rat neonatal cardiomyocytes. But this is less significantly less than you would expect from an adult human cardiomyocyte. Okay, so the field now is at a point where we can relatively easily make pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes for, for use in a variety of applications. We'd like to transition now to other cell types. Right? So if we want to build heart tissues, we need to think about cell types other than, than just the myocytes. There are endothelial cells and fibroblasts actually are in very high proportion in, in cardiac tissue. There's also um, smooth muscle cells, we have epicardial cells, endocardial cells, neurons, and immune cells that all play key roles. So we, we've been working over the past few years on how we can generate these cell types from pluripotent stem, stem cells and then combine them with the myocytes to make more functional tissue-like structures. Let's start with, with the epicardial cell because this plays a, a key role in development of a number of cell types, uh, mural cell types found in, in the heart. So in embryonic development, you know, the epicardial cells are, are sitting on the epithelial, an epithelial cell type sitting on an external layer of the myocardium. And they, they play the, this key role of populating smooth muscle and fibroblast populations by undergoing an, an EMT where they migrate into the, the myocardium and further differentiate to the, these particular cell types. In the adult, uh, the epicardial cells are more quiescent. They secrete factors that are important in myocardial health, uh, but under disease or injury, the epicardium will be activated and the cells will undergo EMT where they contribute to scar formation and, and, and fibrosis, you know, such as in, in a myocardial infarction. The one Key takeaway here is that if we would like to make cells like cardiac fibroblasts, one starting population would be an, an epicardial cell. So from uh, developmental studies in, in animals primarily, we know that the epicardium and myocardium arise from a, the common cardiac progenitor. Right, so we, we talked about how we can make the myocardial cardiomyocytes from pluripotent stem cells by activating Wnt, inhibiting Wnt, and then culturing the cells. Uh, we, we speculated that there was a progenitor after this Wnt inhibition stage, which would have the ability to also differentiate to the epicardium if we could figure out the appropriate factor to do this. So Xiao Feng Bao, a former graduate student in the lab, tried to figure out what this factor might be. Um, so first, what Xiaoping tried to identify the, the stage of our cardiomyocyte differentiation protocol that generates a uh, progenitor cell that still has the, this capacity to turn into epicardial cells. So based on development, we looked at, at markers like NKX 2.5, ILET 1, FLIC 1, and found that at day six, we have a population that expresses the, the cell types. It also um, expresses KI67, suggesting that we have, some, uh, we have proliferative capacity at that particular time point. So then Xiaoping built a reporter cell line to try to identify factors that will induce epicardial differentiation with cardiac progenitor cells. So WT1 is uh, an epicardial specific reporter in, in the heart lineage, at least. So what, what Xiaoping did is knock in EGFP with a 2A cell cleaving peptide at the um, three prime locus of, of WT1, right? so that when WT1 is expressed, GFP will also be expressed in these cells. And we validated that you know, in, in WT1 expressing cells, we also have, have GFP. So then we use this reporter line to, to screen for factors that when applied between day seven and nine will cause these epicardial derived cardiac progenitors or so these pluripotent stem cell derived cardiac progenitors to form epicardial cells so we looked at cardiomyocyte differentiation by cardiac deponent t and epicardial differentiation through this wt1 reporter and so the untreated 
um, condition here is our standard cardiomyocyte differentiation protocol. And you can see we get 70% cardiomyocytes. Interestingly, there are also 10% uh, W21 expressing cells suggesting epicardial cells might be an upright cell population here. And we, we tried a lot of different factors. I'm only showing you a few here, but a number of developmental factors that have been in, implicated in, in epicardial or, or heart development had no effect. Uh, the, the key one here, though, is, is CHIR. So remember, this is a, a canonical Wnt activator in any condition in which we added the, the CHIR from day nine, seven to nine, we were able to induce epicardial differentiation and got almost no cardiomyocytes. But, so this suggests that if we can uh, apply Wnt activation at the appropriate stage of the cardiac regenerator, we can generate epicardial cells. As we did significant additional characterization to, to show that we were getting epicardial cells, so in this process, you know, with our control, again, is, is cardiomyocyte differentiation. We really don't have very many WP1 positive cells, and they're not epithelial in nature. We do see some speed muscle actin positive cells. If we add uh, CHIR in this process, we, we got the epicardial cells, but they de-differentiate. We no longer have WP1 or ZO1. Um, if we then add a TGF beta inhibitor after the CHIR, we were able to maintain their epicardial status. So we maintain WT1 and ZO1. Uh, what one key factor here is that both is that primary epicardial cells also cannot be maintained in culture. They undergo an epithelial from the zinfimal transition. So it appears that th this this TGF beta inhibitor is preventing these stem cell dried epicardial cells from, from de differentiating. So, based on that, uh, we're able to expand these stem cell derived cardiac regenerators, so able to now generate higher populations of cells with a number of different TGF beta inhibitors. And again, addition of these TGF beta inhibitors allows us to get about up to 25 population doublings of these WT1 expressing cells. Uh, epicardial cells are not as easy to assess their, their functionality as cardiomyocytes. They don't like, beat, so there's not this cool video I can show you. Uh, one of the things that they do do is make retinoic acid. So we, we identified that they express ALDH1A2, uh, an enzyme involved in, in retinoic acid production. They also have an, an epithelial type of morphology. So by day 15, you can see a nice flat monolayer cells that, that express ZO1 and beta-catenin at, at the junctions. Uh, we, we collaborated with, with Tim Hacker in the, a small animal uh, cardiac facility at UW-Madison. So, so Tim's group has developed a, a cardiac patch consisting of extracellular matrix proteins synthesized by primary cardiac fibroblasts this is a sheet of ECM. We took that cardiac patch and seeded it with our stem cell derived um, WT1 positive epicardial cells expressing GFP and delivered that to the surface of a, a mouse heart with a myocardial infarction. Uh, then by tracking human mitochondria, we were able to illustrate that these epicardial cells were able to differentiate to smooth muscle actin positive cells as well, suggesting that they have this capacity in vivo to form um, neural cells that express SMA. These cells did all, were also able to migrate into the myocardium. We saw a, a loss of, of cells through time uh, because these, uh, these animals were not immune compromised, so we, we anticipated the, this loss of cells. Okay, so now we have this epicardial population and we wanted to use this to stimulate a, a process development of a process to, to generate cardiac fibroblasts so in uh, the mouse heart through developmental tracing studies it's been found that about 80 percent of the fibroblast population in the myocardium arises from the epicardium the second heart field uh, provides another source of, of cardiac fibroblasts so we then uh, developed a process to generate cardiac fibroblasts from the epicardium from our epicardial drive cells. So building on the work I showed you before, to make epicardial cells, a student in the group, Martha Floyd, 
identified that if we treat these for 10 days with basic fibroblast growth factor, we generate cells that express cardiac markers as well as fibroblast markers. Our collaborator in this project, uh, Tim Camp, a, a, a scientist in his lab, Jin Huazan, developed a different process to make cardiac fibroblasts that goes through a second heart field progenitor rather than epicardial progenitor. So, so Jin Hua here found that uh, activating wind signaling drives these cells to a second heart field, and then she cultures the, these cells for 18 days in the presence of, of BFGF. These express also cardiac fibroblast markers uh, in a slightly different manner than our epicardial drive cells. I'll discuss that in a bit. So we, we worked with Tim and Jinhua to compare the epicardial fibroblast population with the second heart field fibroblast population. Um, both of these, again, express cardiac fibroblast markers like FSP1, CD90, as well as uh, fibroblast markers, vimentin, and, and staining with the TE7 antibody. Uh, the second heart field fibroblast here express TBX1, a marker of the second heart field. The epicardial cells have much lower expression, whereas the epicardial derived fibroblasts express higher levels of TBX18 in the second heart field. So these are different in their, their developmental lineages and express T-box proteins or genes that are indicative of that. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the, the differences in the matrix composition that is produced by these different fibroblast populations. A key role of fibroblasts in the heart is to synthesize and remodel extracellular matrix. So here we, we collaborated with Brenda Ogle at University of Minnesota to profile the, the matrix produced by different fibroblast populations based on mass spectrometry on, on these cellular matrices. So we cultured these cells to very high confluence for several days, remove the cells, digest the matrix, and, and run mass spec. And this was done on the epicardial derived fibroblasts from stem cells, second heart field fibroblasts from stem cells, uh, comparing that to primary fetal cardiac fibroblasts, primary adult cardiac fibroblasts, and primary dermal fibroblasts. I'm not going to go down to the level of individual proteins here, um, but I want, just want to show you differences in class of proteins. Some key ones here are matricellular proteins, which are the signaling proteins. So that's this, this color here. Linking proteins, which are structural proteins. Basement membrane, orange. And then you know, other key uh, matrix proteins like collagens and, and elastins. First thing to notice here is that these are second heart field and epicardial are, are relatively similar. Um, we have some differences in, in basement membrane here. A little bit more matricellular and epicardial, more collagens in the second heart field. If we would compare the stem cell derived fibroblasts to primary cardiac fibroblasts, they're much more similar to fetal than adult. Adults have many more matricellular and fewer linking, and they also have, have more cytokine production. Uh, all the cardiac fibroblasts are very distinct from human dermal fibroblasts in the matrix. So the dermal fibroblasts make much more collagen um, than they do the uh, matricellular types of proteins. So now we decided to ask what effect do these cardiac fibroblasts have when we combine them with cardiomyocytes in, in a micro tissue? So this is a collaboration with Todd McDevitt at Gladstone University as part of our Center for Cell Manufacturing Technology. Has lab developed these uh, micro wells in which we can make tissues by seeding in different cell types. And so these are pyramidal types of 3D tissues. You can, you can seed cell types in these, culture them in that, let them assemble, and then after one day, we remove the cells and culture them in suspension. So we did this with cardiomyocytes alone or cardiomyocytes mixed with different fibroblast populations, the epicardial cell derived fibroblasts, the second heart field derived fibroblasts, or primary fetal fibroblasts. One thing you notice is that including any fibroblast population causes compaction of these tissues in the microwells, and when we remove them in suspension, we get much better aggregate formation. Right? So uh, we see, again, and should note in this case, we use two cardiac fibroblasts 
corticardiomyocyte in these tissues. This is roughly the ratio of these cells in the myocardium. We, we then took a look at these steroids, staining them for cardiac deployment T to identify the cardiomyocytes and vimentin to identify the fibroblasts. And you can see that each steroid does have a mixed population of these different cell types. We then did functional analysis. So we used um, this GCAMP6 calcium reporter IPS cell line to generate the, the cardiomyocytes here. So you can see as these uh, cells beat, flashes of green which reflect release of calcium to the endocellular stars. So here we have the epicardial derived fibroblasts, and this is under a paste condition at, at one hertz. And we're now we're going to look at the, the second heart field derived fibroblast spontaneous contraction. You can see these are, are beating independently. Sometimes these are joined and synchronized, but most of the part these are independent. We, we perform pacing on these to make the analysis much easier. So what I'll show you in the next slide is we, we quantified the fluorescence in different spheroids as a function of time. And then we can fit the fluorescent intensity to a, a curve to identify key features of calcium handling. And so we, we took all these images for the for four populations, cardiomyocytes alone or cardiomyocytes mixed with epicardial derived fibroblasts, second heart field fibroblasts, or I mean human fibroblasts, and then uh, fit the amplitude of fluorescence as a function of time to identify calcium, key calcium handling parameters. This is the, these are the curves here. You can see that uh, by adding in epicardial or second heart field drive fibroblasts, we see acceleration of the peak faster than the cardiomyocytes alone. And we see higher amplitude with the stem cell derived fibroblasts than we do the, the fetal cardiac fibroblasts. So, so quantifying some of these important parameters here, time to peak was lower with the epicardial derived fibroblasts and second heart field derived fibroblasts than with the primary human or with no fibroblasts, we also see maximum upstroke velocity was higher, again, with the stem cell derived fibroblasts. There was really no change with the maximum downstroke velocity. So what this suggests is that we're seeing some acceleration of calcium handling parameters that signify maturation in at least this phenotype by including our our stem cell derived cardiac fibroblasts with cardiomyocytes in these tissues. And so based on the work we've done to date, we've developed processes to turn pluripotent stem cell derived cells into cardiac regenerators that can generate cardiomyocytes or epicardial cells, and these epicardial cells can be used to make fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells. So we're beginning to build processes now we can make a lot of different cell types in the heart and, and combine these to better model the interactions of different cell types in, in heart tissue. Right, for, for the rest of my presentation today, I'd like to focus on, on some of the processes involved in scaling and reproducibility uh, of, of making cardiomyocytes. So if we think about the, the process of making a cardiomyocyte, uh, from an engineering point of view, we can split this up in, into two steps. So the, the purple here are the upstream steps. This involves sourcing all of our materials in sort of initial culture, genome editing, and expansion differentiation of bioreactors. Right then there's the, what's called the downstream steps. So this involves any separations processes, enrichment, pooling, formulation filling, distribution, or, or prior preservation. So what, one goal that we have in our center is to increase scale. But what I showed you up till now is lab scale differentiation in, in the six well, um, Play, you know, we can make millions of cells, but clinical doses and trials are hundreds, or hundreds of millions to billion to a billion cells. We need ways to improve the scale. Robustness is also important. There's significant batch to batch and line to line variability I'll get to. So one of the things we'd like to do is, is be able to monitor this process and, and improve it that way. And similarly, assess the, the metrics of quality during manufacturing. All of the metrics I've shown you up till now, we, we look at the end of the process and try to assess our, our cardiomyocytes. But it'd be nice to somewhere during this expansion differentiation process tell where we're on track. So in, in terms of, of, of scaling, uh, 
in collaboration with Todd McDevitt's group, we've adapted our, our 2D process to 3D in, in these, in these um, spinner flasks of 3D suspension. Here we can culture our undifferentiated cells as aggregates and then induce differentiation. This will lead to formation of cardiac T cardiomyocytes around day, day seven or so. So you can get you know, high percentage populations of cardiomyocytes. This, this is a, a really high run. Typically, the, the results are significantly lower than this. But one of the key advantages of moving from 2D to 3D is we increase scale and reduce cost. So in one 3D bioreactor here, we can make as many cells as, uh, as we can in, in 40 petri dishes. So what this does is it dramatically reduces the media cost. We get many more cells per volume, uh, roughly the same cost of, of plasticware, but it also reduces the amount of time that a technician spends per day. It only takes five minutes to change the media in one reactor. In 40 dishes, it can take up to 45 minutes. Right? So um, what, what we've been able to do now is transition to this 3D culture to make many more cells. So I'm going to focus more on the, our ability to monitor process reproducibility. Again, this is the overall process in which we guide cells to cardiomyocytes by activating lint signaling, inhibiting lint signaling, and after about 10 days, we should have spontaneously beating cardiomyocytes. The, the, the problem is uh, we really don't know much about why this process fails. So sometimes we run this process and get high percentage of cardiomyocytes. Sometimes we run this process and get a lower percentage of cardiomyocytes. What we'd like to be able to do is monitor this process, measure something, say at day two, that can tell us whether we're on the right track to get a good differentiation or whether uh, for some reason this differentiation is going to fail. With that information, we can do two things. First, we could stop the differentiation, cut our losses, and restart it uh, so to save some time. Ideally, what we'd like to be able to do is correct the process. So we don't have a, a corrective action that we can take yet. We're currently working on that, so I'm not going to be able to tell you about that today. But I will tell you about our ability to monitor and, and identify whether a process is working early. So to get a better understanding of what's going on in differentiations that succeed or fail, we did what was you know, collected samples at different time points during this differentiation process and subjected them to RNA sequencing, I subjected metabolic footprinting. So here we collected the culture media and profiled the metabolites in that by NMR. We also collected the cell pellet profiled the metabolites inside the cells by uh, mass spec, and we collected the proteins from the cells and also performed proteomics by, by 2D mass spec. We did this on a lot of different differentiation runs. We bend these into successful differentiations, or I'm calling it a good differentiation. In this case, this, these got about 75% cardiomyocytes. We also uh, performed the same analysis on, on a bad differentiation. So at the end of the process, in this case, we only had 25% cardiomyocytes based on cardiac component T. So by, by comparing the different proteins, metabolites, and genes at these different time points, we were able to identify uh, some markers of successful versus failed differentiation. Today, I'm going to only tell you one piece of this story that, that centers around the cardiac progenitor step. Right. So as we talked about before, you know, we were able to make iPS cells and, and differentiate them into the multipotent cardiac progenitors by activating lint signaling and then inhibiting lint signaling at day five. We had these progenitor cells. They can make cardiomyocytes or they can make epicardial cells. We're interested here in their ability to make cardiomyocytes. Another feature of these cells, though, is this is a very good stage to cryopreserve them. So we can take these cardiac cells, freeze them. They freeze very well. We can then thaw them onto a plate, and then gener they'll generate cardiomyocytes. So we ask, is there something we can measure at this cardiac progenitor stage that will tell us whether we're going to 
efficiently generate cardiomyocytes from them when we thaw them or not. So first we screened for cardiac progenitor batches for their ability to generate cardiomyocytes. And some of the batches give us very high cardiomyocyte yield after they're thawed. Here we, we measured the cardiomyocytes at day 16 and some low, right? So the high here was about 85%, the low was about 25% cardiomyocytes. We then took these batches of cardiac progenitors and then at, the, at that cardiac progenitor stage, we performed RNA sequencing and ATAC sequencing to try to identify genetic features of you know, high and low efficiency of differentiation. So um, if we first just look at a transcriptomic comparison RNA sequencing, we can see that these high and low effectiveness of cardiomyocyte differentiation separate tremendously on, on the principal component one, which explains 98% of the variance. And we found about a thousand genes that were upregulated in the cardiac progenitor cells that gave us a lot of cardiomyocytes and a thousand genes that were upregulated in the samples that gave us low cardiomyocytes. If we performed a pathway enrichment analysis on the, the up and down regulated genes, what, you know, we, we found some rather perplexing <laughs> pathways, right? So in, in the, the cells that gave us a lot of cardiomyocytes, we thought adhesion type junctions, but you know, onset of diabetes, axon guidance, neuroactive ligands. In the um, cells that gave relatively few cardiomyocytes, some enrichment of, of a number of developmental pathways. But these, these were not necessarily cardiac related, which, which was a bit of a surprise. So we also performed um, ATAC sequencing of, of, of these cells at the same time point. So what ATAC sequencing does is identifies areas of accessible chromatin or inaccessible chromatin. Uh, so we then mapped these regions to nearby genes and assigned uh, each open region to a, a nearby gene. These are loci that were most differentially open in the uh, cardiac progenitor cells that gave us a lot of cardiomyocytes, and these were most preferentially open in the cardiac progenitors that gave us low cardiomyocytes. I'm not going to look at individual ones here, I instead kind of want, want to focus on integration of, of these multi-omics data sets. So what we're plotting on the, the x-axis here is the RNA sequencing data, so gene expression. Over here, we have higher expression in the cardiac progenitor cells that gave efficient cardiomyocyte differentiation. And here we have higher expression in the cardiac progenitors that do not generate cardiomyocytes. On the y-axis, we have chromatin accessibility. So then these are um, more open chromatin in the cells that make cardiomyocytes efficiently. And these are more open in the cells that do not make cardiomyocytes more efficient. As, as you can expect, we, we see um, significant conservation where open chromatin and high expression tend to correlate, although not always. We do see some discordance here. We're going to focus on, on these two quadrants where we have open chromatin and high expression in the, the cells that make cardiomyocytes, and then open chromatin and high expression in the cells that don't make cardiomyocytes efficient. So now if we perform an integrated analysis, so, so both here, we can see in the, the high efficiency differentiation pathways that are involved in things like secondary organization, muscle development, cardiac development. Um, whereas in the cardiac progenitors that do not efficiently make cardiomyocytes, we see other developmental systems. So, so kidney, for example, eye, visual system, connective tissue. So this is more in line with, with one, what one might expect developmentally. So what we did next, what was try to integrate our data set with a data set in the literature from, from Strober et al. So the Strober et al data set took 19 different iPS cell lines from RNA sequencing on this every day. And you know, what we, so what we did was identify their cardiac progenitor stages day six, compare their day six differentiation with um, day 16 cardiac cell flow cytometry. 
by integrating our data set with the store at Al, what we're able to do is identify markers that are conserved in different cell lines. So they use different cell lines than we did and by different operators. And so clearly different people in the lab did, did the differentiation, perhaps a little bit differently than people in my lab did. So then we did a, a plot here trying to identify genes that satisfy three criteria. One is that they have a log two-fold change of greater than five in our RNA-seq and as well as in our ATAC-seq, but also in the strobert RNA sequencing data set. Based on this, we found this set of what we call high potency attributes. So these are these cells, cardiogenic cells, have the ability to turn into um, cardiomyocytes. And these, a lot of these are um, heart development or cardiomyocyte related, things like Titan, MRI 6, NKF 2.5, 2.6. A couple of these you know, have not directly been implicated in heart development as well. Interestingly, we only found one conserved attribute in the low potency cells, the, this transporter SLC 7A11. This is perhaps not surprising because bad differentiations might occur for, for a variety of reasons. But what we're doing now is using these high potency attributes in our screening of our cardiac progenitor cells to identify batches that are able to efficiently turn into cardiomyocytes down the road. Okay, last bit here I'd like to describe is our efforts to profile maturation in per potent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. So as I indicated earlier, one of the roadblocks in per potent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes is that they never reach an adult-like state. So even after extended time and culture of up to several months, they're small, uh, they generate little force, they don't have the uh, fully aligned myofilament network of, of cardiomyocytes, and they have relatively slow ion handling. So we've been focusing on, on identifying molecular markers that are good proxies for some of the phenotypes that are, are difficult to, to develop. So we performed an uh, experiment in which we generated cardiomyocytes from pluripotent stem cells and then maintained these in culture for uh, up to 190 days. Uh, performed, in this case, global metabolomics, so intracellular metabolomics on the cells. We're able to identify 274 different metabolites by mass spec in the cells. And you can see the, the progression of, of differentiation here from, from day 30 up to day 113, and then a dramatic shift up, uh, up to day one, 190. We also performed intercellular proteomics by mass spec, and again, you can see that the, the, the protein composition of the cells changes along principal component one here throughout the uh, six month long experiment. So we analyzed these data sets to try to identify the top metabolites and proteins that are changing during differentiation or maturation under extended culture. So you, here uh, you can see blue is, is low abundance, red is high abundance. Some features decline in abundance through time. Other features here increase in abundance. And we, we found a few interesting ones that I'll point out that seem to be good markers of the developmental stage. Okay, so isovalent carnitine, for example, comes on between day 60 and 99. Um, Acetylcarnitine comes on a little bit later. Both of these are involved in import of acetyl-CoA into the mitochondria. And we have galactical, which comes on early and comes off later. So this is a, a enzyme involved, or metabolite involved in, in galactose metabolism. We do the same for proteins. Again, we, can, we found a number of protein markers of different developmental stages. So natriuretic peptide A, this uh, comes on very strongly at day 113. This protein protein homolog, which is a negative regulator of tubulin deacetylation, comes on between day 60 and, and 99. And between 99 and 113, we see strong upregulation of this modulator relent signaling A. Uh, secreted Brazil related, secreted Brazil related protein five. Right, so based on these proteins, we you know, we can identify benchmarks of, of maturation. We've been trying to 
combine these, these types of, of data sets. So here we're going to focus on one particular class of proteins and metabolites. I call this V3. So these are the ones that become abundant at the very latest stages of, of maturation. So in our day 190 sample, but a relatively low abundance before that. If you look at the proteins and metabolites in those features and we combine them, so we can really identify 33 metabolites and 285 proteins in each of those groups, combined those and performed a CAG pathway analysis. We found that there are nine statistically enriched pathways at this latest time plane. Most of these are metabolic in nature, uh, interestingly. So uh, things like fatty acid degradation, uh, glycophospholipid glycosphingolipid biosynthesis, um, amino acid degradation, and, and PPAR signaling. So some of the really interesting biomarkers of this late stage um, maturation at the metabolite level, triacylglycerols and acetylcarnitine uh, give us very good distinction between three month and, and six month old cardiomyocytes. At the protein level, components of PPAR signaling or targets of PPAR signaling appear to be very useful markers. So now we're trying to come up with ways to use these to, to, to screen for factors that induce maturation. All right. So in summary, today I told you about our efforts to manufacture different types of cardiomyocytes using bio-inspired protocols that identified WINT pathway and, and TGF-beta pathways, BFGF pathways as key regulators of, of uh, cell pet specification, using this in, to build new models of development of disease, and hopefully these will advance cell-based therapies. Uh, to assist our manufacturing efforts, make them more reproducible, and monitor cell progression during this process, we, we've identified genetic features as well as proteins and metabolites that can uh, probe for differentiation efficiency in the maturation state. We hope that this will enable closed-loop control and, and batch release criteria based on important markers. So I'd like to acknowledge the people who, who did the work here. Uh, so I told you a lot about uh, the work of, of Lance, Xiaoping, and Martha on, on differentiation. The multi-omics analysis was primarily the work of Austin and Aaron in the group. Great collaborators, Tim Camp has worked with us on almost everything cardiomyocyte related. Um, also, like to, to point out work with, with Pod and, and Brenda uh, and Rabindranath, who, who worked with us in building tissues and in some of our multi omic analysis. So, thank you very much for your attention. Did you happen to have any any questions for me? Feel free to reach out to me by email at my University of Wisconsin address.